Well, hello and welcome to Revelation Bible Study. I am Dr. Jason Hughes, and this is Lesson 13. We are looking at Chapter 9 today. I hope you're well. I hope that your family's well, and uh, I'm excited to walk through this chapter with you. It certainly is a unique chapter, and in many ways, uh, hard to comprehend. And so we're just going to ask God to help us and lead us through this as we look to His Word together. Dear Father, we thank you for who you are for loving us and protecting us, your children. We thank you that you're a very present help in times of trouble. We thank you that you're our mighty fortress. Uh, we thank you that you are our shield. Uh, when we stop and we think about how good you've been to us, we can't help but to marvel at your grace, your mercy. Oh Lord, thank you for uh, dying for sinners like us and for transforming us and transforming our future. Lord, we thank you for the glorious hope that awaits us, and, and we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you for the Lamb of God who is slain. Um, we thank you for that immense sacrifice. Lord, um, move among us now as we seek your presence by studying the Bible. Uh, illumine our heart to the truth that you would have us to know by your Holy Spirit. Uh, guide us and shape us and help us to know how we can apply this truth in our lives. Father, bless these folks who are seeking you in your word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's dive in. As always, uh, one thing we're going to do is a little bit of review. Last time we uh, saw this chart, which kind of uh, helps us keep track of all the, the different types of judgments we've seen. Uh, so far, we've only dealt with seals and trumpets. Um, in chapter 8, we got all the way to the fifth trumpet. We stopped after completing the fourth trumpet. And remember, there was an ominous warning from an eagle about the final three trumpets. And those were called woes. In other words, uh, in, in an incredible um, sense of uh, escalation, it seems like uh, if you thought it was bad before, well, these woes certainly are far worse. So I hope that you've had time to uh, read through uh, some of this, uh, some of the uh, text. It's always helpful to read ahead so that um, you can be chewing on the scripture, so to speak, uh, well in advance. Today, we're going to uh, break it up in halves and um, I'd like to begin by just focusing on the first woe, the fifth trumpet. So let's look to the word together now. Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like woman's, or women's hair, rather, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still Two more woes are coming after these things. My, what a passage. 
uh, of Scripture. I want to pause and just review the timeline before we get into the details uh, of the first woe. Uh, remember that we have already progressed through the first six years, even to the final year of the tribulation. We discuss the telescopic arrangement of these judgments. And that just means that the seventh seal contains the trumpets and the bowls. The seventh trumpet contains the seven bowls. Uh, if you are confused by that, I can totally understand why you would be. And I would just advise you to go back to chapter 8. Um, or, which would be Lesson 12, and uh, you can get some clarity on this particular theory of the chronology of these judgments. Uh, what I want you to see, the main point of reviewing this chart, is not only to situate us within the timeline, but also just to get a sense of the nature of the escalation. Right, In The first six seals go throughout the first six years of the tribulation in this model. And the trumpets start in the final year of the great tribulation. I mean, it's almost as, as the end approaches, things elevate astronomically. And it's pretty hard to understand or imagine or, or, or fathom because things have already been so bad. But as we'll see, as we've just read, uh, it certainly is going to get worse. I wanted you to be mindful of that as we take a look at some of the details of the fifth trumpet. Let's review by uh, taking a look at this outline. Uh, we saw that the trumpet was blown. It's important to remember that the trumpet was blown uh, under the sovereign authority of God. We know this in a sense because, of course, it was Christ who broke the seals, and the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets. Um, of course, we know from many other passages of Scripture that God is sovereign over all things. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Danny Aiken um, does so well in his commentary is he, he really stresses that Christians should make sure that they understand that none of this happens without the sovereign permission of God. And, you know, people will maybe have problems with that. They, they will have to wrestle and uh, settle some things in their heart. But the truth is, you wouldn't want it any other way. If there's any area in this creation that God is not sovereign over, then you can imagine a God that's better. And Christian philosophy says, if you can, if you can imagine a God that's better, then the one that you're thinking of is not God. Now, I hope that that's not as clear as mud either. I hope that, that uh, you can understand what I'm trying to communicate. The next thing we see is pretty hard to explain. Um, and I want to stop and, and just try to dive into this. There's so many things to discuss, but, you know, John, in many times in this unveiling, uses figurative and metaphorical language to describe things that you know are really indescribable, hard to communicate in just words. And oftentimes, um, because of the nature of those things that are so vividly described in this rich figurative language, uh, some commentators, some scholars, some believers um, end up taking a position that the, in, the entirety of the matter is just symbol, and symbolic. What I mean is, instead of uh, saying that this is a figurative way to communicate a real event, what they say is this is just symbolism for the greater struggle between good and evil, and these aren't real events. Well, I think that is um, very much uh, an accurate view of Revelation. And we've talked about that in some sense in the first several lessons. Um, what is, what's important to note is that John does use symbolism, but his symbolism is designed to help us understand what actually will happen, literal events in the future. 
So in this particular half of chapter 9, we see an unusual star fallen from the sky. And the first thing that sets us off to this uh, peculiar star is that it's referred to as he or him with the masculine pronoun. So immediately we know that this is not an asteroid. This is something different. Uh, we'll talk about that in greater detail in a minute. Uh, what we see next is that this uh, star, we'll say for now, is given the authority to open the abyss. Um, and so in, in this outline, we see that we already have a clue that it's opened by an angel with a key. Next, we see that the five months of torture take place by an army of locust demons. Oh my. Then we get more description, vivid description, however figurative, of this locust demon army. And finally, uh, the announcement is made that the first woe is past, um, but there is still two more. All right, so let's dive in and think about some of these details. The first woe, as I've already mentioned in the timeline, it escalates the judgment of the tribulation to an unfathomable level. Um, and we haven't even gotten to the bowls. I mean, it's just like I said, um, things have already gotten so bad in the first six years of the tribulation, it's hard to imagine they can get worse, but oh, how worse can they can get. Uh, it's, it's just an, an amazing um, jump in intensity. And so, um, the first way that it becomes so intense is obviously with this first woe. And we've talked a little bit about this unusual star. And um, I've already mentioned that he is referred to in the masculine. But it's also uh, important to note that the language that's used is a perfect participle, he had fallen. And that generally indicates something that's happened in the past, but has an ongoing or continuous effect. Well, when you take all these things into consideration, including some other key text, uh, and the actions of this uh, particular star, um, I think the best interpretation, the viewpoint that I come down on, is that this star is none other than Lucifer or Satan. Lucifer actually means star of the morning or son of the dawn and if you look at some key text um, in the Old Testament you'll get a lot more uh, of the, the background that I believe supports this this interpretation if you look at um, Isaiah 14 um, 12 through 15 you'll see a description of Lucifer and how in pride he sinned and fell and then when you turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, there is the specific verses about him as the anointed cherub. Uh, one point about that, that passage of scripture is that uh, it's, it's a very unique passage. In a sense, it's a proclamation against the king of Tyre. But what happens is, as you read this text, you quickly realize that this can't just be about a human. Uh, in fact, it describes things like, you were in the Garden of Eden. And so we know that it, it definitely is referring to Lucifer or Satan. Um, this can often be interpreted as um, either a, a double fulfillment. Um, in a sense, uh, these things are true of the king of Tyre. Uh, in some symbolic way, and they're literally true of Satan. Or one another way of thinking about it is just that the author could be trying to show the spiritual realities behind the actions of the king of Tyre. Nevertheless, um, most conservative scholars agree that this text absolutely is referring to Lucifer, uh, the fallen cherub, the adversary, which is where we get the word Satan. In verse 13, uh, I'll start a little earlier at the end of verse 12. It says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Well, that was not the king of Tyre, the man. You were in Eden, 
the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on my holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Till iniquity was found in you. It goes on to say that um, he became filled with violence and sinned. And God says, therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Uh, you can read the full context of this passage, but I do think it supports um, that this text, in uh, particularly talking about a star fallen, it very well, very well may be referring to the fall of Satan. If you remember, Jesus in Luke chapter 10 also uh, refers to this event when he says, um, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Let's see. Yes, he says uh, those words exactly. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So, um, it's very interesting that um, Satan is allowed to play a key role in this moment. Uh, in, in many ways, the grace of God has been removed from the earth. And all the ways that God had been restraining uh, the enemy and the forces of darkness, they are now allowed to run loose a little more. Now, they're still constrained. We'll talk about that. We see that, of course, they're limited by time. They only have five months. They're limited by power. They can't kill, only torment. Now, it's horrific, and I, I get it, and we'll talk about that. But... Um, you still see that God is controlling. He's allowing. He ultimately is the governor. He says what he says what goes and what does not go, and that's so important, and um, ultimately a comfort for me to know that even the baddest answers to Him. Uh, Martin Luther used to say that um, even Satan is God's Satan. In other words, he wouldn't even be. Um, allowed to exist if God hadn't allowed him and um, just so that you know we as people as creatures have to trust that God knows exactly what he's doing as he allows this in this case he's using evil to judge evil and that'll be clear as we walk through the end of the text so he's given this this authority he's given this key to the pit of the abyss there's a lot about this pit in the Bible. I say a lot. There are some other texts. Um, it seems to be this holding place for uh, fallen angels or demons. And in 1 Peter 2, verse 4, we have a reference uh, to it. Also in Jude, I'll read the one from, from 2 Peter There we go. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Uh, that's the verse, and of course it continues with other uh, information about Noah and that generation. But the point is, is that this verse points out to us that God actually cast out demons to hell and bound them in chains. Well, if you look at the, the um, details of our text today, what you see in Revelation 9 is a clue and I'm trying to give you the exact verse where it actually refers to them as, as bound. And uh, for 
some reason I'm not able to put my my um, finger on it at the moment. I'm sure it'll come back. I may even have a point on it. But the bottom line is it it it, it gives us some evidence that um, you know good angels don't need to be unleashed. They're not bound. Of course, it's fallen angels, judged angels that are bound. And of course, the abyss, the pit of the abyss, certainly seems like Second Peter two four. And so. God, in his sovereign authority, allows Satan to unleash these demons upon the unbelieving world. Now, I've already mentioned uh, John's use of figurative language, but, um, you know, there are some scholars that, uh, in my personal opinion, this is so hard for the rational empirical culture to accept these realities um, they, they tend to lean towards trying to decipher these symbols as something that we're familiar with and uh, one example is uh, many people will look at this uh, locust demon horde and and try to think about how all of these descriptors could be John trying to describe modern uh, machines of war. You know, I understand, um, you know, how they may be thinking about that, but, but when you get these details about demons being unleashed from the pit of the abyss, I, I don't think that that is um, uh, a symbolic uh, revelation. I think this is literally referring to the spiritual realm and real fallen angels that have been waiting for this moment as we will see that they, they, they've been prepared for this moment which is even another uh, ball of wax and in a real sense um, you know christians we live in this type of uh, dichotomy uh, we live in a world where uh, the secular minded uh, almost mock us because we believe in heaven and hell and we believe in spiritual things. Uh, we believe Satan is real and Jesus communicated with him. Um, he made him also, by the way. We believe in demons because, of course, Jesus spent much of his ministry casting out demons. My point is, we believe in spiritual realities that we can't see. And uh, to the secular mind, it sounds like nonsense. But in the fifth trumpet, the first woe, the unseen spiritual world is of darkness, at least at this point, only darkness is unleashed on the physical. In other words, um, there is going to be hell on earth. When God's grace is removed and these demons are given permission to torment, um, it's certainly um, incomprehensible. Uh, uh, incomprehensible. It's just so hard to kind of wrap your mind around. It's very scary, I mean, frankly. Um, but notice how they are restrained. Um, when we look at the symbolism of all that John says to describe these locusts, I think we get a sense of, of what they are. And if we were just going to try to keep a responsible distance from the symbolism and, and just try to figure out what does the symbolism communicate about these demons, well, it says they're numerous, it says they're relentless, it says they're virtually invulnerable. Uh, in other words, uh, one commentator I read said it's going to take a greater spiritual authority to stop these demons. Uh, in other words, no human can stand up against them. Uh, we also see that uh, they're organized, even, even with leadership as a king um, commands them. We see that they're terrifying uh, and cruel and loud and some commentators think maybe even seductive I mean how how ironic and um, and sinister would that be that, that these creatures have the power to seduce you into being tormented um, in agony of course uh, we could really dive deeper um, we could think about um, what a scorpion uh, might, what kind of pain a scorpion might inflict on a human today, and and get a sense. Um, 
one author said that uh, when a man is bitten by one of the larger scorpions that um, they're in such agony they, they basically roll around on the ground um, their mouth foams and they grind their teeth now when you start imagining you know these supernatural uh, demon locust uh, inflicting torment and, and that it goes on for five months and that these people who are not sealed cannot even escape it they can't even uh, commit suicide they can't even um, use death to escape it really gives you a sense of the scale of this judgment um, we've talked about how there will be God's people among um, this tribulation period we know we believe that the church has been raptured that's my our viewpoint but we did discuss how their God had aligned a, a, a messianic uh, Jewish evangelism core that would be preaching the gospel and helping people trust in Jesus during this horrible time. And so when it says only people who are not sealed will suffer this kind of torment, um, the implication is that the, the Christians who are sealed will be protected from this woe. And, um, you know, thank the Lord for that. Okay, well, I know that's a lot, uh, but I want to keep moving because we have one more word to get to. Let's look at the last half of the chapter, verses 13 through 21. Then the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Let me stop right there and, um, you know, I, I think that I have probably failed to kind of give you the, the biggest sense of the state of things. Um, in other words, a, a picture that encompasses all that's happened. And there's a quote um, from John MacArthur and that I want to read for you because as we see the sixth woe, uh, executed on the earth and its inhabitants who aren't sealed. Um, we need to just understand how different the world is going to be at that point compared to now. MacArthur says, So intense will be the, the torment inflicted on unbelievers that in those days Men will seek death and not find it. They will die and death flees from them. We certainly have seen um, a little bit about that in um, the fifth trumpet. However, what I'm trying to show you is the biggest snapshot. And I want to make sure I tell you uh, the correct passage. Um, so he continues he says all hope is gone there will be no tomorrow the earth people have loved and worshipped idols and all that they loved and worshipped will be utterly destroyed the land will be ravaged by earthquakes fires and volcanoes the sea will be filled with putrefying bodies of billions of dead creatures much of the fresh water supply will be turned into bitter poison. The atmosphere will be polluted with gases and showers of heavenly debris. Then, worst of all, will come foul smoke from the pit of hell as the demons are released to spiritually and physically torment wicked people. The dream of a worldwide utopia under the leadership of the Antichrist will have died. Driven mad by the filth and the vileness of the demon infestation, people will seek relief in death, only to find that death has taken a holiday. There will be no escape from the agony inflicted by the demons, no escape from divine judgment. All attempts at suicide, 
whether by gunshot, poison, drowning, or leaping from buildings, will fail. That's from MacArthur's commentary on Revelation. Uh, it, it is, um, it's something that is so horrific. It, it certainly should motivate us. It should give a, an urgency to our witnessing. Um, it should really mobilize us to share the gospel with as many people as we can. Because in the end, uh, when people choose to reject Christ, uh, according to John chapter um, 3, verses 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, uh, the Bible says that if they reject Christ, they're, ar they're already judged. In other words, uh, rejecting Christ means that this is what awaits them. So let's continue on in our text, starting with verse 17. And I, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not cured by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts now we talked about verses 20 and 21 last week and how sad it is that even after so much uh, horrific judgment uh, their hearts are hardened and they refuse to repent uh, many that is so uh, it, it shows us that even when given an opportunity to repent, that some will not. So if we're reviewing the last half of chapter 9, we see that the trumpet is blown, the second woe begins, we see a third of humans are killed, we see that the four Euphrates angels are released, and then we see a 200 million horse demon army kill a third of humanity. Um, they are really the instrument. Uh, and so it almost seems as if the four angels from the Euphrates uh, have the authority to unleash this huge uh, demon army. Some have, it, it, certainly in recent history, have kind of looked at this 200 million figure and thought about uh, China. Um, because, uh, of course, as we'll see as we continue to study Revelation, there, there is mention of the kings of the east. But again, when it begins to reference literal demons, it's hard to conflate China with this demonic horde. Of course, we get the descriptors again, the symbolic de uh, descriptors of these horrible, evil horse demons. And then, uh, sadly, we see the refusal of the survivors to repent. Okay. Let's talk about these details as we uh, close out our Bible study um, in the next 15 minutes. Uh, first, we see notice that the voice that gives the command is unspecified. Um, but it is a voice, and it did come from heaven, and it issues the command. It reminds us of God's sovereign authority. Uh, of course, we see John using more figurative language. And really, the ferocious imagery describes creatures that are designed to cause death. And the biggest sense, the biggest picture, is that God uses evil forces to kill those who are evil. And you and I, you or I, are not perfect judges. We don't see the heart of men like God does. But at the end of the day, God is holy and just and righteous, and what he deems wicked is wicked. What he judges is deserving of judgment. He is a just God and a just uh, Savior 
He is a just judge as well. Despite the cataclysmic scene, which is really beyond uh, what we can understand, uh, I'm sure you've gotten that point by now, uh, people are still absolutely bent on witchcraft, sorcery, idolatry, sexual immorality, and, um, you know, in, in a real sense, they they can they can choose to deny God, but what they can't choose is the consequences of their choice. And this uh, unimaginable scene is those consequences of rejecting God. Okay, so um, this slide looks like it is out of place, a repeat. But what I want to do is uh, kind of conclude um, our time by wrapping up that this second woe, this sixth trumpet, and then all talking about some of the implications. There is a time coming on this planet that none of us can truly fathom. And, uh, you know, we always hear uh, the secular, uh, the humanists, the materialists, the scientific... Uh, those who, who worship really at the altar of science, they believe that science is the infallible authority. And, uh, you know, I try to remind those folks that just 400 years ago we thought the earth was flat. But those people, you know, they're, they actually have been deceived. And it's sad, but what I'm trying to show you is that they are deceived to think that they are walking in wisdom. And yet we who have been exposed to the truth and believed and, and understand by the Holy Spirit, we know that God is going to make the wise foolish. He, and, um, you know, this is what it's going to look like when that happens. Some of God's judgments during this tribulation uh, will be focused against wicked people. And we have to understand in the biggest sense of things, even after this, everyone is going to um, face um, judgment and these non-believers will have to face the great white throne judgment. Some of the judgments during the final tribulation uh, will be carried out by demon forces. I think that's what we see. I think that's pretty clear. Now, you may disagree, understand. Uh, you know, do do some wider reading, and uh, if you're interested, take a look at other viewpoints. Um, I just don't see it. I, I I think that this is literally hell on earth, and um, if God wanted to describe, um, you know, machines of war, well, he could have used those words, but he didn't. He used locust demons and horse demons and armies of demons from an abyss, a pit in uh, hell. Um, I didn't mention much about Abaddon or Apollyon. Abaddon means destroyer. Uh, this is the king that commanded the locust army. Um, some commentators believe that this is either the Antichrist or Satan himself uh, commanding uh, the armies. Uh, it's certainly interesting. Um, and to think that the saints will have an eyewitness view of all that goes on. Um, it's going to be pretty incredible. Another thing we can see is that these uh, evil forces are well organized. Okay, um, I think we often overlook that in our naivety. Um, you know, I think uh, Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis is, is a wonderful kind of uh, exercise of the spiritual imagination to contemplate how Satan might be going about killing, stealing, and destroying as a roaring, as a roaring lion on the earth. Um, we know that we don't wrestle against flesh, but enemies of spiritual darkness, and they have a plan. Also, we see that uh, evil forces take the lead in destroying other evil forces. And, you know, this is not new. Um, for example, if you want to look in the Old Testament and see where God uses an evil empire to judge 
uh, people who have uh, fallen into wickedness and sin, um, you can see how God uh, set up Assyria and Babylon to judge his chosen people in the Israelites, in Judah and um, the tribes of the north. Of course, after he was done using those enemy nations as a tool uh, to judge, he judged them. And uh, certainly, it was a harsh and just judgment. Human sin may be summarized as refusing to worship God rightly and refusing to love others. And when you see people in this hell on earth uh, still practicing uh, debauchery and immorality and witchcraft and, and all these things, you, you really see that it, it, it is an act of rebellion in their heart against um, the Ten Commandments, against God, against uh, you shall not have any other God before me. And even the language mocks the idols. God spends the whole Bible mocking the idols, uh, you know, saying they can't see, they can't hear, they can't answer you. Um, why would you put all your hope in something you carved out of wood? You know, you can read the, the major prophets and see a bunch of that type of language. It really, uh, I think, if anything, it solidifies that the Bible communicates something very clearly. There is a serious problem with the human heart. If you really want to know what lies beneath all of the problems our world faces, it is the sin-sick human heart. And we know that the Bible teaches us that it's only by faith in Christ and His death on a cross and His uh, presence in your life that that heart can be changed and you can find the solution for your sinful heart. Finally, people whose hearts are hardened by sin may refuse to repent even when they are given the most severe warning possible. And yeah, I mean, if you're not going to repent and, and follow God when this is happening, you, know, you have just uh, decided that uh, you are not going to worship God. Some applications. These are from Kenneth Easley's commentary. Uh, he writes, Be aware of the reality and fierce power of the demonic and rejoice that God always limits the power of the demonic. I think particularly Christians don't have to be afraid. Um, if you think about the doctrine of the indwelling spirit, that the living God uh, takes up residence and lives in your body as a, as a temple, then you don't have to worry at all about the demonic. You're in Christ, and Christ has authority, right? The demons say, don't destroy us, son of the Most High God. Uh, don't throw us into the pit. You see, there's a reference to the abyss again. In other words, uh, he has authority, and he lives in us, we in him. And so we don't have to be afraid. It certainly should give us uh, some motivation to obey God, should it not? Um, when you think about this, this is how serious sin really is to God. And um, I would just invite you to, to meditate on that in your devotion. Think about the events that we've seen thus far in the tribulation and think about what the severity of those events communicates about just how bad sin is. Finally, uh, rest assured of God's protective power for his chosen people. Because of the blood of Jesus, God protects his children. Uh, I um, have added some of these and uh, kind of uh, used Easley's uh, applications and then uh, tweaked them a bit. But um, one, this particular part about the blood of Jesus uh, is mine. and it. I'm so glad it's mine, for real, right? Now, when you study these things and you believe the Word of God because uh, you know it to be true through your experience and you know through its fulfilled prophecy and, and uh, through the Holy Spirit confirming it in your heart, and you talk to other people, they're going to say this. They're going to say, I'm, I'm having a hard time believing that loving God would do this to His beloved creatures. And, and, you know, that's a legitimate question, and I think that mature Christians need to be ready to handle those type of questions, right? 
Uh, we should always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within us. And certainly one of Satan's uh, most common tools is to attack the character of God. And so finally, I just want to share with you maybe some responses that you can go to when uh, a conversation turns to this. One of the things I want you to do is become so comfortable with discussing these things that you can take that opportunity and turn it into a gospel-centered conversation. And maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit uh, will move and the person will believe and another uh, child of God will enter the kingdom. So here's some pointers of how to respond. First, God's judgments are designed to bring repentance and justice. Um, you know, we don't know just how many people will come to believe and trust God during the tribulation. But um, remember, uh, as we looked in chapter 7 and 8, we saw a, 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 a countless multitude that had been saved um, by the blood of the Lamb. And those people had to be saved out of the tribulation. Um, they were added to the church, but they were not a part of the church as it is today. The church had been raptured. But these were people who believed in Christ during the tribulation. In other words, that judgment drove them to repent and to be saved. You know, if anything, uh, look at the Bible and see just how many second chances God gives people, how, much, how patient and merciful and gracious He is. Um, I don't think there's going to be anybody that's in hell and is going to say that God, it, it will not be true if they say God did not give them a fair chance. God is fair. He is amazingly fair. Because the truth is he could have bought up this planet uh, on, the, on, the, on the eighth day and done away with it and, and made a billion more just like it if he wanted to. But he loved you and he has patiently endured. Second, we should grieve for any soul that rejects Jesus because it is judged already. I've already alluded to this. You can look at this passage of scripture. Um, you know, we all quote John 3.16, but we don't all um, treat uh, the Bible or the gospel like uh, John 17, 3.17 and on uh, teaches us to. Uh, now, it does say that God didn't come in the world to judge but to save, but then it says if you reject that, then you've been judged already. Um, in light of these coming horrors, there should be urgency in our testimonies. Of course there should be. Um, I don't see how anybody could read this and, and begin to think about it and think about, well, if, if I'm wrong and my non-Christian worldview isn't right and Christianity is right and this is what I might face, that ought to motivate you to uh, at least uh, genuinely explore the claims of Jesus Christ. No man on earth has made a greater impact on history than him. I'll just remind you that still to this day, there hasn't been one hour in all of uh, the last 2,000 years where people weren't constantly studying every word that Jesus said. Think about that. Next, our holy God will destroy evil forever. I think when you point out to people that how sin and evil entered the world through sin and rebellion and through uh, Satan and his role, and you also show them the gospel and all that God did in Christ and his death and resurrection to uh, reverse those effects and win victory back. And then you show them these end things. Um, they have to see that God's both merciful and uh, wrathful. And that means that those who reject God are enemies of God. Now, we love everybody, even enemies, and we pray for them, and we're supposed to forgive them, and we're supposed to respond to evil with good. But that in no way um, cancels out the fact that God makes it very clear that those who reject Him are His enemies. In fact, the Bible says that we were His enemies, right? We were children of wrath, sons of disobedience, uh, we were enemies with God, whether we knew it or not, before we believed and were saved. And, uh, of course, it's through the blood of Christ that we have peace with God. 
And not only that, he's adopted us into his family and made us co-heirs and joint rulers or joint rulers and co-heirs uh, with Jesus, which means that he's going to lavish upon us graces that are just indescribable. All the things that Jesus deserves, Jesus is kind enough to share with all of God's people. Important, God is sovereign over all of this, even using evil to destroy evil. You know, even a middle school um, student can uh, use their brain and, and think through these things and say, well, something to the effect of, well, if God knew all this was going to happen, why did he make Satan? Uh, why did he, you know, ultimately that's the question, right? Why, why does he allow what he allows? And, you know, I'm always trying to help people realize that who are we to even think we're on his playing field to ask him such questions? But God is patient and loving and kind, and, and I think, uh, you know, we can ask tough questions of God. I think that he allows us to share our heart. We see that with King David in the Psalms. And here's an easy way to think about it. It seems that in God's sovereign plan for everything, he knew that this way would lead to the greatest possible results forever. Now, you think about that, and if you want to talk more, please let me know. You can email me at pastorjason at idlewildbaptist.org. We can find comfort that God is going to destroy evil and recreate the world with no more sin. I mean, at this stage, hell has come upon earth. And, of course, of course we also read in Second uh, Peter that that when it's all over, um, uh, at the end of the millennial reign, right before the new heavens and the new earth, God will completely destroy uh, this universe with fire. Um, so before we get heaven on earth, there is going to be hell on earth. But what a wonderful promise that one day the new Jerusalem will come from heaven and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all evil and sin will be gone forever including Satan himself and we will dwell in the presence of God forever okay well I have uh, you know tried to navigate this chapter um, I hope if anything it will serve as a supplemental tool for you to think through some of these things uh, no one, I don't think any responsible teacher of the Bible, is going to tell you that they understand every facet of these things. Um, and, uh, you know, the more education I've gotten in, in theology through the years, I've realized that uh, the more you study, the more you realize you don't know. And there, there are people who have, um, they're scholars, and they've devoted their whole life to just studying, like, one book of the Bible or um, perhaps uh, all the books that John authored. Are. And so um, my point in saying that is even those men don't completely understand everything. Um, but I am comforted, and I want you to be comforted, that you don't need advanced degrees, and you don't need to you know, have n all this... Uh, uh, factual details and knowledge to know that Jesus is your Lord. I mean, God makes the gospel as simple, so simple a child can understand it. And, um, you know, so I want, you know, this study has been, pro some of you have shared with me this study has been the most in-depth that you have looked at. And I totally understand. And, and, and I try to give you a warning at the beginning. The nature of this book almost requires uh, this type of in-depth look uh, for me to feel comfortable with it. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't want anyone to think that uh, somehow professional clergy, pastors, or uh, scholars, or Christians with certain degrees are the only ones that can study their Bible and learn. And uh, I don't want you to think that all of the education makes them somehow special. Uh, now, hey, uh, if they love the Lord and they're authentic, uh, you know, praise them for God's grace working in their life and, and, and the fruit of their life. You'll know them by their fruit. But don't underestimate what you can do. You don't need to go out and, uh, you know, enroll in seminary unless the Lord's calling you to do that. 
But let me tell you something. I know for a fact that there are sweet little ladies who have been in their Bible more than I ever have because they've been following Christ for six decades, and I bet you they know the Bible far better than I do. And I, I, I hope to encourage you that you can be an awesome student of the Bible as well. Well, if you have any questions about these things, um, even with this kind of detail, we, we are certainly not uh, dealing with every aspect. Uh, if this really whets your appetite, there are uh, dozens of commentaries on the book of Revelation. And if you would like some recommendations on some, some scholars and men of God that I trust, um, pastors, professors, um, just shoot me an email. I'd be happy to share with you uh, what I think are some of the top commentaries. Of course, I'm using them, of course, in this study. Um, if I could rate them, I think Robert Mounts, I think his commentary is one of the best. I, I really love Dr. Aiken's commentary in Christ Exalting Exposition. Uh, it's very user-friendly, even for a pastor. Um, we love uh, user-friendly things and because there, there really is very technical commentaries that get into the original language in, in, in very minute details. Nevertheless, I digress. Just shoot me an email. I'd be happy to talk with you about some more resources for you to study. Well, God bless you today. Thank you so much for your commitment to this ministry. Um, I, I hope that uh, you're involved in Idlewild Baptist Church. And uh, But if you're um, finding this ministry in another part of the state or the world, uh, let me just... Uh, encourage you to find a Bible-believing, Christ-exalting church and begin to discover how God wants you to serve Him. There's nothing more fulfilling in all of life than to use your spiritual gifts for the King of Kings. Well, let me pray for you and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you. We come to you in awe. Um, Lord, the, having a holy or a, um, a reverent fear for you a, a, a trembling is a very healthy thing. And Lord, when we read about these realities that are coming upon this earth, it definitely humbles us, Lord. It, 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 we are so concerned for the lost, yet we trust your perfect judge, judgment, your, your justice. We are so thankful for your mercy and your grace for those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior and are covered with his righteousness and will not have to deal with this type of wrath. Oh Lord, thank you so much. Uh, use us in a way that might glorify your name and help others be saved from these cataclysmic events that will come. Lord, you teach us throughout the Bible by uh, word, in detailed scripture, and by examples that you are God and you are holy and you do not lie. We see that you promised you would send a Messiah and exactly as you promised, in the exact way you promised, Jesus, our Messiah, was born of a virgin and died for our sins. That should teach us right there that you always come through with your promises. And so it's true with these end things. People may laugh, they may dismiss your word in their secular ideas. We just pray that you would open their heart or put a Christian in their path that will love them enough to, to help them see the truth like you helped us see the truth. Father, we thank you that one day evil will be gone and because of your great mercy and grace, we will dwell with you forever with no more uh, pain, no more sin, and uh, we look forward to that day, God. Until then, may your will be done upon this earth. Uh, may you have your way in our lives. And might we bear fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that you have a great afternoon. And uh, I look forward to next week where we'll turn to chapter 10. Until then. God bless you. Bye-bye.